Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me begin today by expressing my deepest and heartfelt sympathies to all those affected by last night's appalling attack in Berlin, to those who lost their lives, those who sustained injuries, and those who lost loved ones, our thoughts are with you. The Scottish Cabinet met earlier this morning, and on behalf of the Scottish people expressed not just our sympathies, but also our solidarity with the people of Germany at this dreadful time. I'm pleased today to publish Scotland's place in Europe, a paper containing proposals to mitigate the economic, social, democratic and cultural risks that Scotland faces as a result of the UK-wide referendum on EU membership in June. Brexit is a problem not of Scotland's making, and yet this is the first detailed plan for dealing with the implications of Brexit to be published by any government in any part of the UK. Now, as is well known, I believe Scotland should be an independent country. And as an independent country, that we should be full members of the European Union. The manifesto in which I was elected as First Minister just eight months ago said this in relation to independence. The Scottish Parliament should have the right to hold another referendum if there is significant and material change in the circumstances that prevailed in 2014, such as Scotland being taken out of the EU against our will. I have made clear, and I do so again today, that the option of independence must remain on the table. Without this option, Scotland would simply have to accept the inevitability of whatever decisions the UK government makes, no matter how damaging they are to Scotland's interests. That is not a position, in my view, that any politician or any party should ever be content for Scotland to be in. And as First Minister, it is my duty to ensure that all options are open to Scotland in these unprecedented times. However, independence is not the focus of the paper I am publishing today. The day after the referendum in June, I made a clear commitment. I promised to explore not just my preferred option of independence, but all options to protect Scotland's place in and relationship with Europe. I said specifically that we would seek to find a solution that would enable Scotland's voice to be heard and our interests protected from within the UK. This paper fulfils that commitment. Indeed, it goes further and it sets out ways forward that I believe would be in the interests of the rest of the UK as well. Scotland's place in Europe sets out proposals to keep Scotland in the European single market and to equip the Scottish Parliament with the additional powers it needs to serve and protect Scotland's interests in the post-Brexit landscape. Now, let me be clear about this point. These proposals fall short of what we consider to be the best option for Scotland and for the UK, full membership of the European Union. So far from setting a high bar for the UK government, they represent a significant compromise on the part of the Scottish Government. They are serious uh, and genuine attempt to build as much consensus as possible, to square the circle, if you like, and to unify the country around a clear plan to protect our interests. I hope and expect that the UK Government, in considering these proposals, will demonstrate the same flexibility and willingness to compromise. Let me turn now to the detail of the paper. It sets out why keeping our place in the single market matters so much. It matters principally to our economy, to jobs, trade, living standards and investment. It is estimated that being outside the single market could cost the Scottish economy 80,000 jobs. Workers could lose £2,000 a year within a decade of a hard Brexit. Being in the single market also ensures protections for workers and consumer rights. It facilitates the flow of skills that our economy depends on and allows all of us to travel, work, study and live across Europe if we so wish. It will guarantee the rights of EU citizens already living here and it provides a platform for cooperation on some of the major issues of our times like climate change. So the paper sets out the primary ways in which Scotland's place in the single market can be protected. It has three main strands. Firstly, we propose that the UK as a whole should stay in the single market.
by remaining a party to the European Economic Area Agreement and that it should also stay in the customs union. Membership of the EU and of the single market are two distinct propositions, as the position of three of the four EFTA countries demonstrates. I accept that there is a mandate in England and Wales to take the UK out of the EU. However, I do not accept that there is a mandate to take any part of the UK out of the single market. It would make no economic sense whatsoever for the UK to leave the single market and it would be entirely democratically justifiable for the UK to remain within it. So the Scottish Government will continue to argue and build common cause with others of like mind for continued UK membership of the single market. However, I, albeit reluctantly, accept that as things stand, given the rhetoric of the Conservative Government, that at this stage seems an unlikely outcome. The Tories seem intent on placing a higher priority on cutting immigration than on anything else. The economy, jobs and living standards all lag behind on their list of priorities. As a result, the second strand of this paper proposes ways in which Scotland could stay in the single market through EFTA and the EEA, even if the rest of the UK chooses to leave. The paper doesn't shy away from the challenges associated with such an option. In fact, it specifically identifies the key challenges. For example, how continued membership of the single market could be achieved without Scotland being an independent country, the legislative and regulatory requirements, the issue of financial contributions, and the practical implications around free movement of goods, services, and people. And it sets out the basis of how each of these challenges could be overcome if the political will exists to do so. It's also important to note that this option does not prioritise membership of the EU single market over continued free trade across the UK. It would safeguard both. Talk of a hard border for Scotland has always rung hollow from a UK government that says no such hard border will be required between a post-Brexit UK and the Republic of Ireland, a continuing member of the EU and the Customs Union. But that argument aside, this paper sets out how free movement of goods, services and people would continue across the UK, even with Scotland in the single market and the rest of the UK not. In that respect, it is worth emphasising that what we propose would not see Scotland having a different relationship with the customs union to the rest of the UK. Uh, we hope the UK will stay in the customs union. If it does so, then this proposal would enable Scotland to be in both the single market and the customs union. However, uh, however, if the UK opts to leave the customs union, then Scotland, in common with other EFTA EEA countries, would not be in the customs union either. There will, of course, be disadvantages to Scottish businesses if we're not in the customs union, although these disadvantages would be minimised if Scotland remains in the single market. However, under this proposal, the border between Scotland and England would not be an external EU customs border. What is in effect a customs union now between Scotland and the rest of the UK would continue. Now, there will be those who say that a differentiated option for Scotland, such as the one we propose, would be too difficult to achieve. And as I have already said, the paper doesn't underestimate the challenges. However, I think it's important to consider these three points. Firstly, there are already a range of asymmetric and differential arrangements in operation within the EU and single market framework. The solution we seek for Scotland would be different in detail and scale to many of these arrangements, but not different in principle. Second, the UK government already appears open to a flexible Brexit approach in relation to different sectors of the economy. It will also be necessary to take a flexible approach in relation to Northern Ireland and Gibraltar. There is no good reason whatsoever why such flexibility should not also apply to Scotland. And lastly, and perhaps most fundamentally, everything about Brexit will be difficult and unprecedented. The negotiations ahead will be characterised by a need to find practical solutions to a range of complex issues. It is in that spirit that we seek to find solutions that will respect the voice and protect the interests of Scotland. The final strand of this paper deals with the powers of the Scottish Parliament. It argues that in light of the removal of rights and responsibilities provided by EU law and whatever the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, 
Scotland's interests within the UK demand that the devolution settlement be fundamentally revised. Uh, the paper looks at three broad categories of powers that must now be considered. Firstly, powers to be repatriated from the EU, which currently sit within Scottish Parliament responsibility, for example, fishing, the environment, justice and agriculture. These must remain within devolved competence. There must be no <coughs> Westminster power grab. Secondly, powers to be repatriated that are not currently devolved but which would enable the Scottish Parliament to protect key rights, for example, employment law and social protection. And thirdly, a broader range of powers to protect Scotland's interests and support a differentiated solution of the kind proposed in this paper, for example, power over immigration. In short, the proposals in this paper are detailed, they are serious and they are reasonable. They are designed to respect Scotland's voice and protect our interests, while also acknowledging the position the UK finds itself in. Let me now briefly set out how we intend to take these proposals forward. We accept absolutely that the negotiation that will start on the triggering of Article 50 will be between the UK and the EU. We are not seeking a separate parallel negotiation with the EU. These proposals are therefore aimed first and foremost at the UK Government. We want the UK Government to make clear when it triggers Article 50 that it intends to stay in the single market and the customs union. If it will not do so, we want the UK Government to seek, as part of its negotiation, a differentiated solution for Scotland as set out here. We will submit these proposals formally to the UK Government through the Joint Ministerial Committee framework for discussion in the new year. The Prime Minister, when I met her in this very room in July, pledged to fully and fairly consider any proposals we brought forward. She repeated that commitment when I spoke to her on the phone yesterday morning, and I welcome that. It is beyond any doubt that the Brexit vote, with its different outcomes in different parts of the UK, has raised fundamental questions, not just about our relationship with Europe, but also about how political power is exercised across the UK. So to the Westminster Government, I say this. Your response to these proposals will tell us much, perhaps everything, about whether the UK is in reality the partnership of equals that you claim it to be. To our European partners, I today reaffirm our belief in and commitment to the core values of solidarity, cooperation and democracy that underpin the European Union. And to the people of Scotland, I pledge this. I will continue to do everything I can to protect your interests as we navigate the challenging times ahead. And with these comments, I'm delighted now to take your questions. Uh, first, Mr. Uh, James. Can I ask, uh, the Chancellor Philip Hammond has said that a special Scottish deal is not realistic. How realistic does that make a second independence referendum, whatever is in this document? Well, if you, if you don't mind, uh, great though my respect is for Philip Hammond, I'm going to rest on the words of the Prime Minister to me yesterday on the telephone when she repeated the commitment she gave to me in this room, in this very spot, in fact, uh, that she would fully and fairly consider the proposals we put forward. I expect the United Kingdom government now to do that. These proposals, as I've said, represent uh, for the Scottish government a compromise on what we consider to be the best outcome. We have looked at this openly and honestly and are putting forward proposals that we think can build consensus and unite people. Uh, I would expect the UK government to show the same openness and flexibility. The only other point I would make to anybody who says, and there will be many people today, I am sure, who will say this is impossible, this can't be done, it's too difficult, is that literally every single thing about Brexit, as we're already seeing, is difficult and unprecedented. We already hear almost on a daily basis the UK government itself uh, talk about seeking to achieve things that have never been done across the European Union. So this whole process is going to demand a willingness to be flexible, to be imaginative, to be innovative and to try to come up with solutions that are about the best interests of the people that we serve. That's what the Scottish Government is doing and I would certainly hope that's the approach that the UK Government will take too. Brian. Mr. Hear what you say about a customs union and that would obviate a need for a customs border between England and Scotland. But the, the, the European uh, economic area is about the free movement of people. So it would require an entry border between Scotland and England. For example, if somebody could travel freely from <coughs> Germany mm. to Dunbar, what is to stop them popping over the border to Berwick? And, and, and 
bearing in mind when people in England were voting, mm -hmm. they were voting to prevent such freedom. Of the, the paper goes into this issue in detail, and you know anybody can read uh, the the ways in which we think these issues can be overcome. People coming into the UK under the differentiated proposal in here would continue to have to show their passports as they do right now. Uh, freedom of movement within the UK would continue, and there is absolutely no good reason why it would not continue to be governed by the rules of the common travel area. It's uh, noteworthy that the United Kingdom government is at pains to say the common travel area uh, predates its entry to the EU and will exist after it in relation to Ireland. Um, in terms of uh, the rights of UK citizens to live in any part of the UK, that would be unchanged. The issue that uh, you raise that is addressed in this paper is the possibility of somebody exercising the freedom of movement to come to Scotland and then seeking to settle in the rest of the United Kingdom. That is an issue that would and could be dealt with through the immigration rules that the UK, the rest of the UK, chooses to apply in the rest of the UK. We already hear, and these are uh, proposals I don't always agree with, but we already hear the United Kingdom talk about checks at the point of employment or checks to access housing. Uh, so that kind of arrangement would work to ensure that people didn't abuse the freedom of movement they would have into Scotland. There is no good reason, and this paper sets this out uh, clearly, why the freedom of uh, people, the freedom uh, of movement of goods uh, and services would not continue within the UK exactly as it does just now. Are you prepared Sarah? to compromise on some of this? Or do you, are you asking the UK government to deliver everything that's in these proposals or will you compromise as you negotiate on well, this? This is a compromise, and I'm very clear about that. I think the best option for Scotland and, and the UK is to be in the European Union. I think the best future for Scotland is independence within the European Union. So this is, in itself, a compromise. Now, I've asked the UK government to consider it fully, fairly, to take time to do so, and I've been given a commitment that they will, they will do that. So I'm not going to start to get to the end of that process and speculate on what their uh, view might be before I've given them the opportunity uh, to consider it. But what we've put in here is a compromise. Uh, that would keep Scotland in the single market. Hopefully, we'll keep the whole of the UK in the single market, but if not, keep Scotland in the single market and deliver the powers to the Scottish gov uh, Government and Parliament to support that. Incidentally, and, and this is a, a point that I think is often lost, uh, while this is a paper that is very much about Scotland's interests, I think there are benefits to the rest of the UK in having part of the UK still within the single market. I think there are benefits to Europe in having a part of the UK wanting to continue to play its part, not just economically, but in all sorts of other ways within uh, the wider uh, European working. So I, I think there are aspects of this paper that would benefit uh, not just Scotland, but the UK and the European Union. Uh, on my final point, is in relation to more powers. More powers are certainly necessary to support a differentiated solution. But even without a differentiated solution, I think the argument for that opening up of the devolution settlement is now overwhelming, given the fundamental change to our constitutional arrangements that come from the EU. Colin. As you said just after the referendum, do you still believe that another independence referendum is highly likely? I haven't changed my view on that at all since uh, I stood at this very podium on the morning of the 24th uh, of June. Uh, but I also said that morning that while uh, everybody knows my views on independence, I, I don't think they can still be a secret to anybody anywhere in the UK or, or indeed across Europe. I said that morning that I would not uh, only look at independence as a solution to this, that I would examine all options. That's what we've done. We've done it painstakingly over the last six months. Um, you know, I say again, and I think it is a point worth repeating, this is the only plan six months on from the referendum anywhere in the UK that has been published setting out a potential route forward through the difficulties we face. Uh, so I said I would do that. I have done that. I now, having asked the UK government to consider this fully and in good faith. I think it's only fair for me now to give them the opportunity to do so. But nothing I said on the 24th of June uh, has changed uh, in that respect. Uh, Peter. Sorry, Michael, and then Peter. Isn't it just slightly unrealistic to expect Theresa May to go along to these negotiations and say, well, this is what we, the UK, want. Oh, and while I'm here, this is a, a different <coughs> arrangement that Scotland wants. You're not going to get a deal in those circumstances. Um, and you're not going to get countries like Spain, surely, with separate problems of their own, to accept it. But Michael, I, I take a very different view, and I, I'm taking this view as reasonably as I possibly can. Scotland didn't ask to be in this situation. We voted overwhelmingly to stay in the European Union, so it's not a problem of our making. 
We recognise, we don't like it, but we recognise that everything associated with Brexit is complex, difficult. Many people will say much of what the UK is asking for is unrealistic, but we have to find a way through this. And that's what we're seeking to do. And Scotland has been told repeatedly, it was uh, told this uh, very forcibly in the independence referendum two years ago, that the UK is a partnership of equals. That England, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland are equal partners in the United Kingdom. Now, I'm simply making the point that if that is to mean something in reality as opposed to just in rhetoric, then surely there must be a willingness to find a way that effectively squares the circle of the different outcomes in different parts of the UK. Will it be easy? No. And I am very openly uh, admitting to the challenges around this. But if there is political will to turn that partnership of equals rhetoric into reality, then I believe there is a way to overcome all of these challenges. And this, as I say, is principally a document aimed at the UK government. If the UK government accepts to make it part of its negotiation, then yes, the next stage will be to convince other European countries of this. And again, I don't underestimate the challenges. But what I do know, uh, and I've experienced a lot of this firsthand over the past six months, is how much goodwill there is towards Scotland and how much of a recognition there is that Scotland as a country wants to continue to play our part in the European family of nations. So I believe this is achievable. It's not without its challenges and difficulties, but everything about Brexit is difficult and challenging. This is about trying to find a sensible way through it. Peter. First Minister, this document says there will be an administrative, an administrative system managing the different conditions of sales and goods destined for the European single market within the two parts of the UK. Now, surely that means, in effect, at the very least, a trade border between Scotland no. and England, between Gretna and Carlisle. No, no, it doesn't. Why not? Well, um, with the greatest respect, I'm about to tell you why not. Uh, and I appreciate, so this is not a criticism, I appreciate you've only just had this document, so I'm sure when you've had the opportunity to read it in full, you will probably be able to answer this question for yourself. The administrative arrangements that that talks about are not about the border between Scotland and England. There is not going to be a differential position in relation to the customs union, so there will be no external EU customs border between Scotland and England. The administrative arrangements uh, are a reference to the arrangements that, regardless of this, will require to be in place for the external UK border, all of it. Now, if the UK put Scotland to one side at the moment, if the UK is outside of the single market and outside of the customs union, it will have to have those administrative arrangements at the external UK border to deal with goods coming in and out of the single market to make sure tariffs are being applied and the correct standards are being applied. If this differential option was to go ahead, then there would require to be an addition to those administrative arrangements uh, that will already be in place to make sure that as goods come in to the UK from the single market or go from the UK to the single market, then the correct tariffs and arrangements are being uh, applied depending on which part of the UK they're originating in or which part of the UK they're being sold in. So that's the reference to administrative arrangements that emphatically and absolutely does not apply to the border between Scotland and England. Simon. Um, paragraph 146 re refers to Scottish government needing powers to establish new regulations in order to meet the requirements of single market membership. Uh, Brian Book, the chief executive of Scottish Engineering, has described this as totally impractical. Um, he says that our manufacturing sector will literally have to adopt two regulatory systems if they were to continue trading with the UK, which is recognised as our largest market. It would potentially make the tendering process so complicated that customers in the rest of the UK would probably opt for a more local supplier rather than try to accommodate the established Scottish supply chain. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I'm going to confidently predict, Simon, that you will spend your entire day coming up with uh, quotes of that nature from a whole range of, of different people. Uh, look, I have very candidly said there will be a range of practical challenges associated with this, but many of those challenges are going to exist regardless of whether or not there is a differentiated option for Scotland, because these are the uh, challenges and practical arrangements that will arise from the UK being out of the single market and out of the customs union. What I am trying to do is not come up with a perfect solution, because this is not a perfect solution, continue to be in the EU would be the best uh, solution, but come up with the best way through this that avoids the loss of jobs, the loss of trade, the loss of uh, living standards for people in Scotland that will come from being outside the single market. And of course, 
Uh, we have a UK government that's saying we'll be outside the single market, but we'll continue to have preferential trading arrangements with all of the single market. Now, people may say that's unrealistic, but if they're right about that, then the differences that will be required between regulation for the rest of the UK and for Scotland in the single market will actually probably not be that great. So, yes, there are practical challenges uh, around this, but there are equally ways to overcome these practical <coughs> challenges if there is a political will to do so. And don't let's forget the point of trying to overcome these practical challenges is that the price of not doing so is lost jobs, lost investment, lost trade and lower living standards for people across Scotland. And as First Minister, I'm not prepared to stand back and just watch that happen. Uh, Muir. Uh, you've made clear that you want the UK government to either endorse uh, continued membership of the single market in the UK or these proposals by the time it triggers Article 50. Will you, if it does not do either, will you at that point decide whether you want another independence referendum? And if you don't, then decide how long do you have to decide if Scotland is going to leave before Brexit? There is a bit of water to go under the bridge from the UK government side. We know the date of the triggering of Article 50. We don't yet know from the UK government whether that's going to be a one-line letter saying we trigger, <sighs> trigger Article 50 or whether it's going to be a more detailed proposition saying what they want from the negotiations. I hope it's the latter, incidentally, and I hope that what we're seeing in this paper will form part of that. Now, I know and I, I understand, so this is... Uh, not a criticism of, of anybody here, that there is an absolute appetite to get me to the end of this process and say what I'm going to do then. What I said about independence on the 24th of June stands, but I've put forward today serious and reasonable proposals. I have asked for them to be considered, so I think it is only fair that I fulfil my side of the bargain and give the UK government time to do that before I immediately start talking about what I do in the, at the moment, hypothetical uh, scenario that they reject these proposals. So I'm going to work through this as I have tried to do ever since the 24th of June in a logical way that puts Scotland's best interests at the top of my list of priorities at every single stage. David. Just on the border issue, given that the most likely solution to the Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland border problem is that moving to the port in Belfast, is the idea that something could be replicated between Scotland and England not a red herring? I, I, I mean, remember, we're talking here, and we're talking here about a UK government that thinks the, the issue of a hard border need not arise between the UK and the Republic of Ireland, even although the Republic of Ireland will continue to be in the EU and the Customs Union and the UK, we assume, will not be in the EU, certainly we know that, but not in the single market or the Customs Union either. Uh, but they think that can be resolved. Now, my point is if they think that can be resolved in the Irish context, and I appreciate the different circumstances in Ireland, there is no good reason why that couldn't also be the case in Scotland. But in any event, what we're talking about here is actually different to that Irish situation because we are not talking about having Scotland and the rest of the UK in a different position in relation to the customs union, like the UK and the Republic of Ireland will be. So, you know, yes, I believe even if we were in that position, the government's rhetoric in Ireland says that there's no good reason why that can't be resolved, but we're not in that position. There will be no uh, differentiation on the customs union between Scotland and the rest of the UK, so the, the Scotland-England border will not be an external EU customs border, and that is a, a material uh, fact in the proposition that we're putting forward today. Yes, Kim. We've had a range of different discussions. I'm not going to go into each individual discussion uh, in detail because many of those discussions are, are private and confidential. But we've had discussions with uh, EFTA uh, at official uh, level as well as uh, discussions uh, with individual EFTA uh, countries. Uh, I was in Iceland uh, not that long ago, for example, and uh, discussed uh, the issues around Brexit with uh, both the, the then Prime Minister and, and, and the Foreign Minister. Um, and we've had, as you know, both me personally, but uh, in particular Fiona uh, and Mike have had discussions with a range of European Union countries. Now, the, the key position of the European Union countries, and I think this would apply to EFTA and EEA countries as well, is at this stage, prior to the triggering of Article 50, this is a, a UK matter in terms of whether there's a differential option for Scotland or not. Uh, they are waiting for the triggering of Article 50 to begin a negotiation with the UK. We accept that. That's why these proposals right now are aimed at the UK. 
Of course, in due course, if they are to work and be accepted, they would also have to be negotiated with other countries across Europe. But first and foremost, this is about uh, us seeking to convince the UK that these are proposals worthy of consideration and worthy of being accepted. Yes. The UK government does reject these proposals from you the early in the few year. Will you then immediately start planning for an independent referendum? Um, I, I would refer you to my previous answer to uh, Mr Dickey, I think uh, I gave that answer to. I, what I've said about independence stands. Uh, I haven't changed my position on that one iota. Uh, indeed, we're consulting at the moment on a draft independence bill. Uh, but I'm putting forward these proposals in good faith and putting forward proposals in good faith and asking for them to consi be considered in good faith it requires me also to uh, accept that people have to be given a chance to consider them. So I'm not going to immediately get to the point where the UK government hypothetically rejects or accepts or whatever. I'm going to give uh, them the opportunity to do what I've asked them to do, consider them. And that, I think, is the right and proper way to proceed. Hamish. Uh, just to go back to the border again, that one of the reasons that many people in England voted for Brexit was for reasons of immigration. And you're asking uh, the Westminster government to accept an open border between Scotland and England with people able to come into Scotland and go to England with the only checks then coming through employment agencies or, or housing. Is that, is that right? Well, people will continue to have checks when they come into the UK, as they do just now. The UK is not in Schengen right now, so if you're coming uh, into the UK from France or Portugal or Spain, you get your passport checked. That will not change, even with a, a differentiated option. The issue is the one that Brian rightly raised. How do we safeguard under this option uh, against the situation where somebody comes to Scotland under freedom of movement and tries to get work or settle in England uh, or, or the rest of the UK. Now, that would be down to, as it would be for people coming uh, from, from other countries direct to England, into the, the systems the UK government puts in place for checks on people uh, to, to, to mean that they're only able to work or live if they have the correct immigration status in that part of the UK. Again, administrative challenges around that, but absolutely not insurmountable challenges. And on the point about immigration, uh, and th this point is made in the paper, I think we are close to seeing a bit of a groundswell, notwithstanding what happens around single market membership for Scotland, a bit of a groundswell around uh, further devolution of immigration powers, not just to Scotland, but to other parts of the UK. Uh, I Obviously, I'm not going to stand here and uh, pretend to speak for uh, the Mayor of London, but I've heard Sadiq Khan talk about the importance of greater flexibility on immigration for London. The City of London Corporation has carried out a major study on uh, how that would work across the UK. Um, so I think we're seeing, regardless of what might happen around the proposals in this paper, a movement where the UK government may have to deal with flexible immigration systems across the UK and find the ways of doing that. Tom. Um, First Minister, um, I wondered if you'd had um, any more behind the scenes discussions with the UK government on, in particular, the, this idea that you could persuade the UK government to stay within the single market and how sympathetic <laughs> Well, I don't want to disappoint you here, um, but most of these discussions with the UK government for us are the same as they are for anybody else. You get hit with Brexit means Brexit and pretty much not a lot else. Um, I, would, I would love it to be that we've got more of an insight into uh, what the UK government uh, is going to do th than we have and I, I suspect that's less to do with them playing their cards close to their chest and more to do with the fact they don't yet know what those cards are going to be. Um, so we, we have to try and read as best we can, just like everybody else does, what direction the UK might be heading in in terms of single market membership. There are some promising signs. I think some of the recent comments of Philip Hammond have been promising in that respect. Uh, but then you get to, I suppose, the hard reality of it being very difficult for the UK government to square single market membership with their very, very hardline rhetoric on immigration and their prioritising of immigration over literally every other consideration, including uh, the health of, of the economy. So, you know, I, I hope that we will see uh, the UK try to stay in the single market and the customs union, but I'm realistic about the, the prospects of, of that at this stage. I, I think we have to assume that that will not be the direction they go in. Interesting, we talk about in this paper how some of the other you know, apparent red lines that the Prime Minister has set could be accommodated 
within the single market. For example, one of the other things that the Prime Minister has talked about is not being under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Well, EEA, EFTA countries are not under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. It's the EFTA court that applies there. So I, I think there are ways in which some of these uh, things could be accommodated. Uh, but freedom of movement becomes, I think, one of those that it becomes difficult to see how that can be squared with continuing UK single market membership, unfortunately. Andrew. Well, It's simply a statement of fact, Andy. This is a Scottish government publication. It has been informed and very valuably informed by the range of expertise and experience that the Standing Council brings to, to bear. Uh, the Standing I think I said this explicitly when I invited them to serve on the Standing Council. It's a group of people that have been invited to be on the Standing Council for their experience and expertise, not for their political views. There's a range of political views around the table. There are some members whose political views I couldn't even uh, begin to guess at because I don't know, talking particularly about the constitutional issue. So it's a Scottish Government paper informed uh, by the Standing Council. There are a range of different views across the Standing Council. But actually, I think where uh, there is absolute unanimity, as certainly as far as I've been able to tell, is the, the belief that Brexit, and a hard Brexit in particular, will do real damage to Scotland uh, and that the Scottish Government, therefore, is, has a duty to seek to try to find ways of avoiding that. And I think there's strong support, I know there's strong support across the Standing Council for the approach we're taking. Uh, Jamie. Um, if you think that independence in the EU is the best option for Scotland, why are you pushing for that more urgently? And surely these options in the paper would end up damaging Scotland? Uh, well, none of these options will damage Scotland compared to the situation of a, a hard Brexit against our will. Now, I, the answer to the first part of your question, this is where uh, I absolutely candidly uh, say that I am very, very uh, aware every single day of my responsibilities as First Minister. Uh, I'm the leader of the SNP, but I'm standing here as First Minister. And my duty as First Minister is to seek to try to represent all of the country and to bring all of the country together as far as it's possible for anybody to do that. Uh, I believe in independence. Uh, but I respect the fact that there are many people in Scotland who don't want independence but would like us to keep our place within Europe. So what I said the morning after the referendum is that I was going to try and square that circle. Uh, I didn't pretend I thought it was going to be easy. I still don't pretend it's easy. Uh, but that's what I'm trying to do, trying to square that circle. And in very challenging, very difficult circumstances for Scotland, for the whole of the UK, trying to find a way through this that might unite people as far as it's possible to do and build as much consensus as possible. I think that's part of my responsibility as, as First Minister. But also as part of my responsibility as First Minister is, is not to allow Scotland to end up you know, in a position where it simply has to accept whatever the UK government decides, no matter how damaging it is, which is why having the option of independence on the table is so important. Yes. Well, I've, I, I talked about red lines a moment ago because I've heard the UK government talk about them. I've been very, very adamant about not using the terminology red lines because I tend to think it, it narrows options and it, it puts people into adversarial positions and we're all politicians and we often are in adversarial positions anyway. But in this, trying to find a way forward, what we've tried to do here is open up as much compromise ground as possible. But I've equally been very, very clear, not for ideological reasons, but for hard-headed economic, uh, social, cultural, democratic reasons, that I think Scotland continuing in the single market is really, really important. Uh, that's why there is so much emphasis on it in this paper. Stuart? Sure. If the UK government accepts this and Scotland does get to stay in the single market, will you drop plans for referendum? Well, I'm never going to stop arguing the case for independence. I don't think that will come as any surprise uh, to anybody. I think, regardless of Brexit, the best future for Scotland is as an independent country. In fact, if we'd been independent uh, this year, we wouldn't be having this conversation because we couldn't be taken out of the European Union against our will. So I'm never going to stop arguing the case for independence. What we're talking about here, of course, is not independence in general. It's independence in the specific context and in the specific time scale of Brexit. Uh, and what I said, and I keep saying this this morning, uh, is that in that context, I would examine all options, and that's exactly what we're doing. 
Right, uh, yes. Just on the issue of consensus, have you had any discussions among Chief parties with this government? Uh, yes, we, we have had uh, discussions with opposition parties. The Scottish Parliament has also had, I've lost count how many debates now, 11, I think I'm being told there, debates on aspects of this. And there has been, in my view, a, a very strong uh, consensus, uh, I think, at least until recently, about single market uh, membership. Uh, so we hope, I hope, we'll get support from other parties on this. Um, I'm not that hopeful for that from the Conservatives. The Conservatives have gone, uh, certainly uh, on the part of the leadership in Scotland, from a position in June of thinking Brexit was terrible, a disaster, and it was all based on lies. And come what may, we had to protect our place in the single market to today, saying that, or appearing to say we should just sort of suck it up and keep our mouths shut and accept whatever uh, deal the, the Conservative government want to impose on us. So there's a real difference there, um, and uh, I'm not that hopeful. I would struggle to see why Labour wouldn't support this. Uh, they've said they wanted uh, to keep Scotland and Europe in the single market but not compromise trade across the UK. These proposals achieve that, so I would genuinely be uh, confused if Labour wasn't able to, to get behind this. And I suppose if Labour was to be in a position of not supporting this, my question to them would be, well, if not this plan, what plan, unless you're just going to be like the Tories and say we've got to accept whatever the UK government wants to, to impose on us. I think this is a credible, workable plan, and I would hope that, that Labour and indeed the Liberal Democrats and the Greens will get behind it. Right, time for a couple more questions. If there are any, I'll come to you in a second, uh, Muir and Michael, if anybody who hasn't asked a question wants to ask one. Yes, on? sorry, I'll take yours. Well, Not that I'm trying to avoid Michael and Muir. <laughs> <laughs> um, under the differentiated option, Uh, this is indeed an issue that is uh, covered in the paper. Um, we, we cover that issue both in terms of the UK staying within the single market, but also the scenario of Scotland only staying within the single market. And yes, there would require, uh, based on uh, the, the EFTA experience, there would require to be contributions. The, the quantum of that would inevitably be down to negotiation, but we look at Norway's contributions and we look at how these things are calculated, uh, and it would almost certainly be the case that contributions, either from the UK or from Scotland, would be less, probably quite considerably less, than the contributions uh, now in terms of EU membership. If Scotland was in the single market under the differentiated uh, solution, then we would... Uh, the Scottish Government would require to pay that, but we make the not unreasonable assumption that if the UK is going to save all of the money from their contributions to the EU, then Scotland presumably would be entitled to a share uh, of those saved contributions and therefore uh, we would uh, be able to contribute it uh, out of that. But these matters will be down to negotiation, but we uh, address that issue absolutely in the paper. Right, Muir. You say in the paper that there's no good reason why Scotland shouldn't enjoy the same kind of treatment uh, that Northern Ireland would in terms of borders. Uh, but surely there is a good reason that the recent history of Ireland, including decades of bloody conflict, mean there are good reasons for treating Ireland differently. And is it not a risk that if Scotland demands the same treatment, it makes it more difficult to, to, uh, to make special measures? I think that's a, a fair question. And as you know, I was in Dublin a couple of weeks ago and I was at pains there, and I think it was well received by most people that I, I spoke to, to, to recognise the particular history of Ireland and, and of Northern Ireland and the particular circumstances around that. And nothing uh, we do will in any way compromise uh, finding a solution for Ireland because, as we all know, the, the consequences of not doing that are too grave for any of us to contemplate. So we are absolutely uh, in solidarity with the Republic and with the, the North, the island of Ireland, in trying to find those solutions. Uh, I'm not trying to, in, in saying there's no good reason, I'm talking about the practicalities. Uh, of course there are different uh, motivations for trying to find solutions for Ireland, uh, but if those solutions can be found, there would be no good practical reason why they couldn't apply elsewhere. Um, and, you know, the, the last point about borders, you know, absolutely, the, the customs border point has already been made. There is nothing in here that would create a hard border between Scotland and England. Uh, but, you know, you look at Norway, Sweden, one country in the EU, one country in the single market, but not in the EU. Nobody has difficulty crossing the Norway 
Swedish border or Switzerland the Liechtenstein, uh, one country in the customs union, Liechtenstein, uh, Switzerland not in the customs union, uh, not even in the single market, but are in a customs union with each other, so no difficulties with border. There are plenty of examples across the European Union uh, and the single market territory of these kind of arrangements working. There's no reason whatsoever why they can't work here as well. And I'll keep the last word to well, I'm, Channel 4. I, I'm, I'm puzzled. Well, let me help you. I'm very puzzled, because here you are, the leader of a party committed to independence, to uh, your country shaping its own destiny, <coughs> and yet you desperately want to sign up to an arrangement under which you will have no say to the single market. You will have less. Now you've got some say under the arrangements you want. You will have no say. This is a contradiction. Come, come. No, no, of course it's not. Um, I, and again, this is covered in the paper, way back, not long after the referendum, set out five tests that I thought should be uh, looked at in terms of judging outcomes for Scotland. Uh, this is not a perfect solution we're putting forward. Uh, it's a compromise solution, and I'm being pretty open about that. But it meets most of those tests in most respects. What it does see in here is the issue of influence in the, the making of the rules around the single market is EFTA EEA countries have less influence in that than full EU members. Uh, they have, don't have no influence. They have some influence, but less influence. Now, you could argue that that's more influence than the Scottish government under the devolved circumstances have at the moment. But, you know, I think it's better to be in the single market with that influence than being outside altogether uh, and losing the trade and the investment. So we're making judgments and making compromises and coming up with proposals that we think are in the best interest of Scotland. That's why I hope that they are met in the spirit that they're put forward in and that we get agreement and consensus around these because they are in Scotland's interests. Thank you all very much indeed.